Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 166. Dining is really hospitality and it's theater. Attention gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi, it's Sue, and thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Gift Biz Unwrapped. At the time you're listening to this, if you're listening the week that it's gone live, my new book, Maker to Master, has been out now for a couple of weeks. And I have to tell you, I am just so thankful to all of you who supported me with this venture, bought the book, and have gotten in touch with me. The responses have been incredible, some of them bringing tears to my eyes. So thank you for that. If you're listening here for the first time, have no idea what I'm talking about and are interested in checking out the book, it's called Maker to Master, and you can find it on Amazon, but also through this link giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash Sue's book. Now, the reason I bring it up is those of you who have read already know, I highlight business owners of a lot of companies that have been represented on the podcast. And I've done that because one of the reasons they've been on the show is that they have been perfect examples of the way to do business right in one way or another. So in writing this book, I brought up a company that I had not interviewed yet, and actually they don't totally fit our area here of gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers, because this is a restaurant called Bluegrass, but they are a model business. And I had to put them in as an example in one of the chapters of the book. So then, yeah, I had to have Jim come on and do an interview with me. So that's what this show is all about. In fact, it was funny because I walked into his restaurant, said hello to him, and I'm like, Jim, we got to schedule a time for you to be on the show because you're going to be in my book. And to be in my book, you have to be on the show. And he's like, okay, when? Let's do it. (laughs) So that just gives you a little behind the scenes peek of what Jim is all about. And it's clearly going to come through when you listen to him speaking. Let's have me stop rambling on and on. Let's get to the show. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Jim Letterer of Bluegrass. Jim has spent over 30 years in the restaurant business. Some companies he's worked for that you will recognize, even if you're not local and from Chicago, are Stouffer's Restaurant Corporation, Don Roth's, and Crawdaddy Bayou. Jim has also traveled and consulted in the food and beverage industry for Universal Hospitality, And he started the Restaurant Row Hospitality Group, which empowered a number of independent restauranteurs while he was president of the board of the Wheeling and Prospect Heights Chamber of Commerce. Fourteen years ago, Jim decided to go off on his own and open Bluegrass. He's taken the fine dining approach to a casual setting, adding in traditional Southern cuisine and a lively atmosphere. Now, Gift Biz listeners, I have to tell you, Bluegrass is one of my all-time favorite places to dine, so I am thrilled to bring Jim to you so you can hear all about his successes. If you don't know Bluegrass and you're not in the Chicago area, you're just going to have to trust me. It is the place to be. Jim, welcome to the show. Well, hello there. Thanks, Sue. I am really excited. You know, I'm there often, but I don't really know a lot of the backstory. So this is going to be really fun for me to learn all about the business and how it started. Excellent. Yeah. No, there's a lot that went into creating what I have, and it's been a lot of fun. And that's been the best part. Well, you're going to tell me all about it. But before that, I want to have you describe yourself in a creative way, and that is by sharing what your ideal motivational candle would look like. So if there was a special color and a quote that you would put on a candle that just totally speaks you, what would your candle look like? My candle, change or be change, is kind of how I've always looked at life. And I always see colors. And rainbow is a big part of how I look at things and and flavor profiles and taste profiles. This business that I'm in, it's kind of fun to create different stimuli because 
I've always looked as dining as really hospitality and it's theater. And people are always looking around and seeing different things. And everybody sees different colors. So I see a myriad of colors, which is kind of fun. And every day you see different things that pop up. Yeah, and I love that you equate that back to food, like the different layers and depth of a dish, right? Correct. Okay. Why the restaurant industry? How did that all happen? Well, kind of fell into the restaurant business. Back in high school, started throwing parties in my backyard. And the neat thing was we weren't just throwing little parties. When I was 15, we were throwing parties and having four kegs in the backyard. And that was something that was tolerated and possible today. If you did that, you'd probably be hung up and for sure, for sure. But I want to know why I wasn't invited to those parties, Jim. Well, <laughs> way back, see, back when. in those days, you weren't in the neighborhood. <laughs> but as I created the different parties and we had these things, I had one person in charge of security. I had one person in charge of sound. I had one person in charge of the food. It wasn't just a gathering. We'd have three, 400 people. And we did these calm parties. But it was really kind of a fun thing to create and see it come to life. That was some serious entertaining. It really was. I mean, it was a big undertaking. And the cool part was, like, for security, I used to wrestle. So the wrestling team came in, drank for free, ate for free, and they made sure that everybody behaved themselves. So I'd have 20 guys who were kind of hanging out and just making sure things went well and everybody behaved themselves well. Back in those days, we self-policed and took away keys and did those things we needed to do. But that kind of entertainment bug, it was always more of a business to me. And as I went to college... I really didn't think I'd end up in this business. And my background was college was more business management and computers. I took a lot of psychology classes, thought about going down that road. But then as I exited college, I kind of fell back into working the taste of Chicago for a friend of a friend and just had a great time. And so you decided that that was what you were going to at least try out first, the whole hospitality business, right? Well, the taste of Chicago I actually worked for a friend of a friend who was managing a Stouffer's restaurant. Oh, got it. So that's kind of how I worked for the 10-day soiree, setting it up, having a good time. And then a week later, I was working for Stouffer's Restaurants. <laughs> there you go. Now, I've got to tell you, I went to the very first Taste of Chicago way back when. That was crazy. Share with our listeners what Taste of Chicago is so people who don't know will understand. Taste of Chicago, as it was created years ago, was more smaller independent restaurants along with some bigger local restaurants. And it was really a lively stage for food, live music. And it's down at Grant Park, which is right on the lake there. And it's just a great backdrop. And it was a 10-day just extravaganza. The food and everything else was just tremendous. And he had some big restaurant tours. And things were different then. The city's kind of changed it quite a bit. And it's morphed. And it no longer is what it was. And now you've got more smaller tastes of going around the city every other weekend, where the taste of Chicago doesn't have the punch that it used to have. Right. It used to be huge. I don't know how many different music stages. And it was always in the middle of the summer, so that was great. Correct. It was really the only taste of Chicago in town. It's all the smaller venues that have forced it to change and really challenged its ability to be successful. So now you get into the restaurant industry, but you're working for someone. So talk us through Correct. a little bit of that and how the evolution came to Bluegrass. I want to really focus on Bluegrass, but I just want us to get there. So, I mean, as I worked for Stouffer's, worked there for a couple of years, number of different restaurants, spent some time in Cleveland, and I always enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun, learned how to cook. Every restaurant I've worked in the kitchen, worked with a lot of wonderful chefs and kind of left Stouffer's, got into the bar business for a very short period, spent about a year in the bar business down in the Rush Street area. And Rush Street was the quintessential Chicago kind of area nightlife. That's back when Division was Division. And they used to have the horses keep the crowds in order. And it was really worked well. And there was really only one spot to be. And that was on the Division Street if you were going out for the evening. So as I learned the bar business, I learned that that was something I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. Met up with a guy, Don Roth. And Don Roth really took me under his wing and was almost like a fatherly figure where he kind of taught me the business part of the restaurant scene and relationship building and fine dining and how to manage and run a business. And I worked for the family for about 10 years and started their single, left their married with two kids in the house. <laughs> you know, really kind of grew up. And as I left him, it was somewhat surreal. But as I parted with him, I said, you taught me how to fly and it's time for me to fly the nest. And we had a great relationship for years, still very close with the family. 
And that was just one of those things where that was really where I grew up in life. I spent 10 years there. And then left there, went to work for Lettuce and Tanu. And then I further refined my corporate skills and really refined my business skills as far as how to operate a restaurant. Lettuce has an incredible reputation as well as incredible systems. So it was really a great refresher as far as systems management because I was with an independent for about 10 years. Then I left there and opened up Crawdaddy Bayou where it was a Southern concept and it was a five and a half acre site, three and a half million dollar build outs, 450 seats. It was just a large kind of Southern restaurant. And we went from zero to $5 million in the first year. We had a great team and it was really a lot of fun. And, and, you know, did that for about four years. At that point, I knew that I knew how to open up a restaurant. And that was kind of a, a hinge pin and once again, stepping to the next part of what I wanted to do. Left there, did some consulting and then found that traveling the country was fun for a few weeks. But then again, after about a year you know, with kids, it was like, hmm, maybe this isn't what I want to do. I want to stop you real quick here and point something out, Gift Biz listeners. As you're listening to what Jim has to say, and if you maybe find yourself, you know, you're still in a nine to five, you're working for somebody else. If you listen to Jim, every single step along the way that he took, he was learning something that then he was going to be able to use later. So I think there's a lot of feeling like, oh, you know, I'm working for someone else. I want to ditch my nine to five. Like that's what everyone talks about. Sure. Take a look at your situation where you are now and what learning can you capture that you'll be able to use to enhance your skills, know more, if there are things within your current business that you could volunteer for where you'll pick up more information or more connections. Use the place you're at right now, even if you're looking at something for the future, because there's really valuable learning to be had. And that's what Jim was doing this whole time. And there's no question, any job I took, I would always look at it as an individual I'm working for. And you don't work for a company, you work for an individual and you work for a mentor. And you need to find someone who will help you craft whatever you want to get out of it. And that's really what I did all along my way, knowing I wanted to have my own business. Each step I took was with a different weakness of myself to strengthen it and be able to walk out of that job or that position having more knowledge. Was that intentional? Yes. And actually there was quite a few jobs I took where I took less pay to get the education. So did you always have the dream of opening up something for yourself? I did. Okay. So that was from the start. That was there. And then you're just building your skills, building your knowledge, and really setting yourself up then to be successful right out of the gate. Correct. My goal was to have my first restaurant by the time I was 40. And I started that when I was 25. I said, I'll give myself 10, 15 years to figure this out. Tried going off my own a few times. Was not successful. Each time I learned something I didn't know. And it humbled me at that point in time, but kept learning how to do it. Then I was just like, okay, here's we go. Here's we got to do it now. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think so many people think that those who are successful just landed at their very first try. We could have taken the conversation here and just gone right into bluegrass, but you have just brought up the comment that you took a couple of tries at it, learned some things, and then kind of created the magical formula for yourself as it merged into bluegrass. So let's go back. So after Crawdaddy Bayou, now you know how to open a location, and then you were traveling around, so you got a chance to see how lots of different restaurants do things. Now you're going to start your own business. How did you decide what the cuisine was going to be, where your location was going to be? Let's go there now. Well, I figured in life, you have to take your strengths and pair them with your weaknesses. And if I wanted to create my own concept, this was after 2001, where the world was shifting. And I looked at the opportunities where there was a lot of restaurants and a lot of businesses in general going out of business because the world had just changed. And I saw a lot of different sites that were opening up, a lot of business failing. And I figured this is a great opportunity. One's failure is another person's opportunity. I saw it as the time would be great to get into it if I could figure this out for the last time. And really just kind of started honing in on what my strengths were. I had a lot of recipes from whether it was John Ross, Crawdaddy Bayou, from Lettuce, and kind of brought them together and had a chef, David Teichman, who was an incredible creator. And he partnered up with me at the beginning to create the menu. And ironically, the menu we created six months before we opened up, I'd say 60 to 70 percent of it is still extremely viable on the menu today. No kidding. 30 to 40 percent. We're always changing, keeping lively, keeping seasonal. So we we do have specialty rotate. But the menu we created 
back in 2003 is still the heart of what we have here, which is somewhat surreal as well. Because as you create things, once again, just change or be changed. You have to keep changing and have to keep current. Dave and I opened up Crawdaddy and worked very well together. And we didn't always agree, which was kind of the neat thing. So we would go back and forth and it was kind of interesting. So as I was creating Bluegrass, it was just one of those things where you take your strengths, get them into one spot and try to get everything going in the right direction because there's going to be enough things you don't know that you'll have challenges with. Sure. Okay, so you had your recipes, and Mm -hmm. I just have to jump in and say, it's crazy that you haven't had to change the menu very much, except for the ones you rotate out. But I look at my eating behavior, like I always come and have the same thing, almost always, because I love it so much. Correct. Right, and it is so different. It's not like I can get it anywhere else. I can only get it with you. Correct. So I think that's part of the trick and the magic to your menu. And that goes back to understanding the psychology of menus, which is a whole separate conversation. But when people go out, you, if you and think of yourself, you go to a restaurant, there's usually one or two items which you'll try. Whatever restaurant you want, if you have an urge to have something, you're going to go, let's go here, let's go there. And each restaurant you go to, you usually try one or two things on that menu. Not many people really go through a menu and will try a number of different items on a menu. So as we created Bluegrass, we've got a lot of different things so we can attract a lot of different people. And that goes back to one lesson I learned from a guy, Bob Chin. Bob Chin, for those of you who don't know, his restaurant's a seafood restaurant in Wheeling, and he was in the top three uh, grossing restaurants years ago. He's been around for about 30 plus years. But if you look in his dining room, he's got black, yellow, white, green, 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 2-year-olds, and 102-year-olds. The diversity that he has in his restaurant has really created his success. I've never enjoyed his food and service, but I've always admired the way he has a dining room that just has a myriad of people. We tried to create that on a smaller scale. We've only got 85 seats. So, gift biz listeners, have you ever heard of the psychology of a menu before? I think it's always so interesting to get behind the scenes information from businesses. Even though we all know restaurants, who knew about this whole psychology of a menu thing? Anyway, we're going to get back to Jim's story right after a quick word from our sponsor. This podcast is made possible thanks to the support of the Ribbon Print Company. Create custom ribbons right in your store or craft studio in seconds. Visit theribbonprintcompany.com for more information. So there's another thing that you did different than the norm, I would say, and that is your location. Usually you'd think with a restaurant, you're going to want to fit yourself into where the traffic patterns are, where people are always passing. Right. And you're a little bit out of the way. How did that come about? Well, that was pretty much intentional. Of course it was. (laughs) (laughs) Ideally, once again, through business, I've learned that if you have a good product, that's the old thing, build it and they will come. There are so many mediocre restaurants and businesses out there. If you have a good business, you have a good product, people will seek you out. So as I was creating what I wanted to create, part of the idea was value. And in order to have a good value in our product, we had to keep the prices down. So I couldn't be paying top dollar for real estate. So I was looking at a number of different sites that were what I call B and C sites. I didn't want to be on Main Street USA. I wanted to be able to work for myself and make money for myself where I wasn't just paying the landlord and fighting myself because, you know, you're going to have bad days and then you have to set up for failure before you set up for success. So I found a nice seaside that was really a vanilla box. It had nothing to offer. It was in an industrial park and we just kind of brought it to life. You sure have. No question about it. I mean, rarely is there a parking space open and rarely is there a table open. But people had to find you. People had to learn that you were there. So in the very beginning, once you were established and open, how did you attract people to you? That goes back to the the guy Don Roth, who I worked for for years. And he was old school with Gordon Sinclair and Arnie Morton and Gene Sage, where word of mouth was how restaurants succeeded. The internet was not around. People would make phone calls, but they would talk to people. And we still work our dining room. In the old school way where we know our guests, we know their kids' names, we know where they work, how often they come in, and what they want to see for service. 
and we take care of our guests. So they walk out going, wow, that was really nice. Once again, we're a service business more so than a dining room as far as food. Number one, we've got to be service first. Our food is excellent, and that is something we will always strive for. But to separate from others, you really have to have something that stands out. And in this industry, if you can be service-driven and in any business, it's really service that separates most of the commodity products. Yes, I agree. And Gift Biz listeners, just listen to that because you might be sitting here thinking, well, how does this all apply to me with my product? Service. It is all about service. And so, Jim, what you're saying is when the first people were coming in, you just made sure that their experience was so exceptional that they were going to spread the word. Correct. And we still connect on a daily basis. And I teach my staff different ways of connecting with the guest because that's really what separates us from the others. And other restaurants just don't have the ability to do that. So can you give us some tips? Well, using guests' names, big. People like to hear their name. As we're on the North Shore, we've got a lot of very well-schooled and very particular guests. And either you listen to them, they'll tell you exactly what they want. And as I teach my staff, you have to really listen. Listening is a skill. And listen to what they want and then giving them what they want, and then they'll be happy. The way that the food industry has changed and the way people eat in the last 15 years when we first opened up, it was big portions, kind of that Maggiano's where everybody wants to take leftovers home for the next three days. Today, it's more value oriented and people were doing more half portions, but they want fresh food and they don't mind paying a little more for fresh food. So as our menu hasn't really changed, our portion sizes have changed. And about three, four years ago, we did almost all of our seafood items so you can get in a half portion. And at the beginning, I was very concerned because, of course, we cut our check average But then again, we've increased our profitability. And I kept watching the numbers going, well, our check average is dropping. This is going to be challenging. But then again, profitability was going up. So we do more half portions and more smaller portions. That's what people are looking for. Absolutely. Now, another thing that you do every time I come and see you guys is either you or Joni are always there. And gift his listeners, Joni is Jim's wife. So that's a lot of personal time into your business because you're also, look, we're recording in the middle of the day and your business, well, really, we're going to get to that in a little bit, is also morning, lunch, and night. How do you do that? How are you always there, either you or Joni? What about a personal life? You have kids. Well, the kids are now 28, 29, <laughs> so <laughs> they're no longer hanging out, no longer as a much a part of our life today. But when you started, they were younger. How did you balance all of that? Well, and I waited till the kids got to high school because, yeah, that was very important. And as Joni, she worked, she did kids' birthday parties at Multiplex, which is a local health club, but she was doing 250 to 300 birthday parties a year. And Joni connected with the kids and always has, where I connect with the adults. So it, it's funny at the door, you know, I'll know the adults and she'll know the kids. <laughs> it works for us, but the both of us have a lot of energy. So we start with that. But I do leave. I do take off. And she does leave as well. And we've got good people who are trailing it for us and taking good care of what we do and making sure they understand what our standards are. Got it. Okay, so there's a couple other things I want to talk about in terms of the types of things that you do that you wouldn't always think of with a restaurant. And as we're talking about this, everyone who's listening, I want you to kind of get a feel for this and think about your business and other types of layers, in other words, revenue producing layers that you could add on. Jim, I'm going to share with everybody that you do lots of fun weekend events. Let's talk about those. Well, as we always try to keep our concept and business top of mind, you always have to keep creating new different things. And when we first opened up, we were doing chef demos and we were doing 20, 25 people, but they were very laborious. We did those for years, just kind of fighting through because that was the thing to do. And then as we realized that they were not as profitable, we've come to the point where once again, we're here for business and we're here, you got to make money what you do, but you, you have to create fun interesting, different things, we kind of stumbled back to boils or stumbled into boils. I've known about boils down south for years. And it's probably one of the coolest communal dining experiences that I can ever recall having. So we've brought those to the table and we do those on Sundays. And that really kind of is a wow event where it's all I can drink, all I can eat. And you don't find events like that. 
And that kind of digresses back to back when I was a teenager having parties in the backyard. And when we do these things, we put the keg out front. And as we're right across from the police station every now and then, they come rolling by and they say hello, which is nice. <laughs> Checking out what's up. <laughs> They're still trying to keep an eye on us. <laughs> But it's always, it's like we've got a great clientele, so we don't really have any problems with that. No one's really taken advantage of it, but they're fun events. And we bring in a brewer, we bring in a winemaker. So the people come in, number one, you've got the food, and then you've got this brewer that's talking about the beer that he makes, and you've got a winemaker that's talking about the wine she makes or he makes. So you walk out going, wow, that was something very unique, very different. Yeah, it's always been an experience. I mean, I was there during your chef demos, and I was recently there during one of the boils. And... I see that as a great opportunity to take what would normally be downtime for you for your restaurant. Sunday is usually when you'd be just closed and Correct. using that because you've already got the space. Your fixed costs are already there. You're already paying the rent, but then adding in another layer. That's really interesting. I also like the partnering part of that. Now, do you coordinate all of that or do you have someone else doing some of the behind the scenes things to make these events come off the way they do? Well, I pretty much nurture the relationships and it goes back to days of Don Roth and then life is about relationships and business is about relationships. And as my dad always taught me, find something you love to do, have fun and it'll just come to life and you'll have fun with what you're doing and try to make a business out of it. And as I still play hockey, it, it's funny. Now we go down to the United Center and I get to meet with a number of different brewers that sell beer through Breakthrough. It's been kind of fun to meet the different brewers, and then I invite them into my restaurant, and then we do this event. Yeah, you're kind of muddying the line between personal and business there, but you love it all, so it works. But it all works together. And it wasn't until after 2011 when Breakthrough got into, or Wurtz, got into the beer business. And we were one of the first restaurants to bring Deschutes into town. Did a big Mardi Gras party with Deschutes. Had the owner, Gary Fish, come in. We try to keep these events that you walk in, you get to meet people. We're very serious about what we do, but it's all about marketing and creating a better opportunity for tomorrow. So the events that we do, we don't make a lot of money on them, but it allows us to move forward and keep creating new different experiences, which is not that much different from all of our networking breakfasts that we do as well. Oh my gosh, you're so perfect because that's where I was going next. So let's talk about that. And that's kind of similar in nature. I mean, the interesting thing is I've always been a big networker. And then well, all of a sudden I have my own business and it's very difficult for me to get out. So we started doing breakfast with the local chamber right when we first opened up. And then we just kind of spawned a number of different groups. We had the NABO group. We've got a Kellogg alumni group. We've got a Walgreens group. We had a lawyer's group. We just picked up another one. So we're doing anywhere between six and 10 breakfasts a month. And it's, once again, not about the people coming in. It's about all the emails going out saying, we're meeting at Bluegrass, meeting at Bluegrass. If everybody has a list of 500 or 200, 300 people that they're blasting out to, it just keeps us top of mind and keeps it as an opportunity for us to be successful tomorrow. Not only that, but at your networking events, because as you know, but I'm just telling everybody who's listening, our chamber has their meetings there the first Wednesday of every month. And you draw people because what do you do? You offer made-to-order omelets right there in the morning. So I'm quite sure there are a couple people who would not drag themselves out of bed except for those omelets. And that has nothing to do with your regular offerings. Correct. Our breakfast, once again, different. It started out as just a continental breakfast. Then as I was talking with Ginny, who was the executive director, actually all the breakfast left because there were some other restaurants that were upset that we were taking all of the chamber. And how come the chamber is always going to bluegrass? And I said, well, tell you what, I'll, I can share. So all of a sudden the chamber meeting went to a couple other restaurants and then they very nicely decided they should go back to bluegrass because we did things differently and we kept raising the bar. And they actually the omelets once they came back, which was about 2009. Yeah, I remember when we went somewhere else. Yeah. And <laughs> not good or bad. I mean, I'm not going to make a Correct. comment on that. But I think the other thing here, going back to what you were referencing before, is the pictures. People take pictures when they're at networking events. And where's the networking event? Bluegrass. So you're taking a lot of different angles where visibility continues to come back to you. Because then it's like, okay, Bluegrass, what's Bluegrass? Where's Bluegrass? And then they say, oh, we had the networking event or a chamber event there. But have you ever been there for dinner? all Correct. circles back. So from different angles all over, 
you do another thing that's really, really good. And that is any single event we have, like within our community, well, we'll do a holiday dinner, right? We do Taste of Highland Park, which is a local summer taste fest. You participate in all of that, always. We're a community-based restaurant. We've always done a lot with the schools. I mean, we connect with the first graders for Cinco de Mayo, which is a local the Sherwood school, but about four blocks away, they walk over here. High school kids, we connect with the hockey team. Once again, my kids played hockey. We do the family dinners, get the team together a couple times a month. They come in and have dinner. So we connect on a lot of different bases with a lot of the non-for-profits as well when they have fundraisers, and we, we try to help them out as well. So we're always doing different things, but if you're not community-based, not really connecting at the community level, you're not going to have your ability to be as successful because we do get back a lot. So a lot of your time, but also a lot of, I will say money, I'll go back to that, is more in participating and providing product and all of that in community events versus advertising. Would that be right to say? Correct. Yeah. Our advertising budget is pretty much nil. We don't really market nor advertise, but we do events that keep us top of mind. And I think that's almost more important than just putting an image ad out there which you never know how much you actually get back out of it. Right. But you're doing lots of things. You're everywhere with networking and weekend events and all of that together. So it's not just one thing. It's just the whole combination that you've put together. Correct. And then the other thing that really gives us the internet presence would be the Yelps, the Open Tables, and the Chip Advisors of the world. As we're well-blogged, people walk out going, wow, that was nice. They say a lot of things that I wouldn't even say things as nicely about what we do here, but it's just how we further separate ourselves from the other restaurants that makes the difference. Do you ask for those reviews? No, we've never had to solicit. We just do what we do and do it well, and we've grown the right way, somewhat organically. Mm -hmm. Well, and it helps that you and Joni are both so personable too. I mean, it's just a fun place to be. We talk a lot especially now with brick and mortar and the challenge about having a location. Restaurant is in a way the same type of thing, but if you don't show a unique and a fun and a welcoming and friendly experience when people are there, even if your food is good, people aren't going to come back. Correct. It's a combination for you, I would imagine. I can't be an expert in any way in the restaurant industry, but you've got to have good quality food, but you also have to have that ambiance, that friendliness where people really feel good about the whole experience when they leave. Whatever you're doing in different businesses, you have to separate yourself from the rest. And there's a lot of what I call commodity businesses out there. And and restaurants are, to a certain degree, in that genre of there's a thousand restaurants. And, and why would guests want to come here as well as why would an employee want to work here? We can't pay the best dollar, but we've got a great working environment. People actually like working here. Are we paying the top dollar the best in the area? We pay our staff very, very well. But we have a great group of people that allows us to create the funness and the spontaneity, and they do very well as well. So it's really kind of a full circle. It's not just the front door, it's the back door as well. Everybody wins. Everyone feels good about it. Same thing like with vendor relationships. You've got to make sure you've got people that are working with you and helping you. And it's been kind of fun because as a business owner, I get to select who I do business with. And if people don't want to play nicely and don't want to be nice, well, we don't have to deal with them. And I try to surround myself with whether it's vendors, whether it's guests, whether it's staff, people that want to buy into what we're trying to do here and and help support and grow what we do. Absolutely. Have you ever had a situation where you've had to part ways with a vendor or you've had a frustrating customer that you've had to just say, dinner's over tonight or whatever you would say? But have you had a challenge like that? There's no question. I mean, that's part of the nature of the beast. The number of times I've had to escort people out of here are probably in in 15 years I can count on one hand. But people get belligerent and get silly, but it's got to be controlled well. And that's part of, once again, we've got a lot of different types of personalities in where we've got an open door. We've been very fortunate. It's only been a handful of people. Vendors, there's no question that I have standards and that vendors have to buy into what we're doing. And either they work with us or I'll find somebody else because there's too many challenges and they understand what I'm looking for. And just like, once again, I deal with Breakthrough. They've been a great supporter by providing these 
brewmasters and winemakers to come in to help entertain my guests, which once again, they help me, I help them, I sell their product and they help support us in different ways. So it's a two way street. And as I move enough of their products, they're pleased to work with me. And as we help market them, it's a two way street. There's other people that don't like doing that. Then you guys just aren't a match. Correct. So as you look at the future, you've referenced already, as we've been talking, that you've really had your eye out to see how things change. An example was the dishes. People are looking for really nice, solid quality, but smaller sizes. Right. You've taken advantage of social media as that's come into the forefront to get visibility. How do you look to what's going on now and to the future? How do you capture those things that you need to change within your business? That's a fully loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> you only have to give me one answer, Jim. <laughs> well, I mean, with technology, everything's always changing with technology and food as well. So I've always looked at this as a business more so than a restaurant. And it's not about me. It's about the guest, the guest experience, either we're growing or we're dying. But we're always sourcing new, different things. I've never wanted to be a trendy restaurant, but I've always wanted to be a successful business. So we just brought on the Impossible Burger. This was something just, I don't know sure if you've heard about the Impossible Burger. I haven't. Sounds like I need a visit. <laughs> but it's a vegan product. Well, there you go. My daughter's all ready for it then. It's been created in Southern California, and it's a sustainable product that can be recreated through plants. This is a plant-based product, but it's... I'm going to call it like a chemical assimilation of a burger. And they've just been released in the last few months. And I wasn't looking for this, but it was brought to my attention, ironically, by a friend I play hockey with. And there I was in the locker room. He's telling me about this. He's a vegan. So I started looking it up. And it's a pretty cool product. And there's a tremendous amount of money behind it to bring this to fruition. And as we've added to the menu, in the last two weeks, we're selling about 20 of these Impossible Burgers a week which is actually a lot for, once again, the product that it is. So we're always looking for things that will make a difference that can impact us in a positive way. So I think what you're saying is you're really being attentive and listening and seeing what can apply. Correct. Yeah, because you could have very easily, you know, you're just hanging out with your hockey friend, whatever, just it's part of a conversation. But when he mentioned it, your antennas were up and you identified that there was a possibility and then right. integrated it in. And now you're seeing that it's working. And whether there's a number of different things, you got the restaurant show coming up in a couple of weeks, which is a, another big idea kind of generating show. We're always looking to add things to the business and keep us viable and keep us lively and keep us current. And since we're not looking to be, once again, the trendy spot, we have to be able to figure out what else we can do to keep us kind of in the mainstream and keep us busy. Mm -hmm. And another reason to come back again. And that, that's always top of mind. How do we get people to come back? Right. As well as create an experience that is something different. Absolutely. To all the other things that you do, like the weekend activities, events, all of that as well. As we wind down here, I'd like to invite you to Dare to Dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box, Jim? Inside my box. That's, hmm. I'm thinking like a lobster or a crawfish or something is going to come out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I've always tried to live my life and enjoy what I have and not live beyond my means. And it's always been fun and enjoyable that I've been able to keep things going and growing my life. And as I'll be a grandparent in a few more months, see the second child get married off. Health is a big thing to me. So having a healthy body and a healthy mind is probably the most important thing moving forward in life. Totally agree. And congratulations. I can't wait to hear more about what's happening in the future. Next time I see you. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Jim, thank you so much. I really appreciate your coming on. Now I know more about bluegrass than I ever did before. So there that's super go. exciting. I love that. And some really solid business learnings for our audience, which I also appreciate. And I think the whole thing that got threaded through all of this was service. Being a service to your customers and your employees, providing something both in product and also atmosphere and experience that people love is really what's made you such a success. No question. And it's just 
separating yourself from everybody else and be what you want to be and do it better than anybody else. And you do, Jim. <laughs> and I'm I so glad trying. you're right in my area <laughs> so that I can be there all the time. Thanks, Sue. Thanks again. I really appreciate it so much that you came on and shared the whole story with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. And I'll be back into the restaurant very 